Hello, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us. My name is Musab Ali Abdul Karim. I'm from uh, Sudanese Researchers Foundation, and I'm co-moderating this webinar with Mahadahawi from University of Khartoum and Valeria from Sorbonne University in France. We are very pleased to welcome you all to Trend SRF webinar series. We in SRF co-organize this webinar series in collaboration with Trend in Africa. Trend in Africa is a non-governmental organization dedicated to science education and science capacity building in Africa. Today, we are very excited and delighted to be joined by Professor Evelyn Sernagor. Evelyn is a professor of retinal neuro neuroscience at the Newcastle University Institute of Neuroscience in the UK. She worked as a visiting Forgatry, Forgat, Forgat the fellow at the National Institute of Neurological Disorders and Stroke, and also at the National Institute of Child Health and Human Development in the US. And then she worked as uh, associate scientist at the Smith Cattlewell Eye Research Institute in San Francisco, California. And after that, she joined Newcastle University as a senior lecturer in developmental neuroscience. In 2018, she promoted to a full professor of retinal neuroscience. Today, she is going to talk about basic statistical analysis to explore scientific data. Uh, but before we get started, I just would like to remind our audience that this webinar is designed to be interactive and they can ask as many questions as they want by simply typing their questions in the event page on Facebook or in the comment section of this YouTube live streaming. And the speaker will respond to their questions during the Q&A session at the end of this webinar. Evelyn, thank you so much for taking time out, out of your busy schedule to join us today. Now I'm going to turn it over to you. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Mossab, and uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, I'm very pleased uh, to be with you, at least virtually. Um, and uh, so the lecture I'm going to give you today has nothing to do with my own research, and it's going to be very basic, uh, <clears throat> but very important because we know that many students, many researchers, young and older, don't really always know how to use statistics to uh, analyze their data. So what I'm going to give you today is a is a really introductory lecture on uh, basic statistical analysis to explore uh, scientific data. Um, so, uh, so you, I mean, you're all scientists at various levels and you collect data. Your data can be data in the lab or it can be clinical data. And at some point your, exper your experiment is over. And so what is the next step? I mean, you you may have like huge amounts of spreadsheets, lots of numbers. So what are you going to do with that? Uh, because uh, you need to handle that data so that you can make sense of the results of your investigation. And the way you will, you will treat your data will depend on the nature of your study. Um, for some people, it could be a purely descriptive study. For instance, you counted how many male and female crocodiles living in the Nile in the Khartoum area. But that's probably not the case for most of you because uh, you are scientists and your work is most probably hypothesis driven, which is much more interesting also. Uh, if it's hypothesis driven, it means that your, your experiment is designed so you're going to test your hypothesis and then you're going to have to prove whether that hypothesis is true or false. And, uh, and the, the way you're going to do that is by uh, using your data and comparing numbers between different experimental groups and that will help you test your hypothesis. Um, and so you will use statistics uh, to address that phase of the work. So what is statistics? Statistics is the study of data. It means how do you collect data, but we're not going to talk about that today. How to summarize the data that uh, once you have uh, collected it and how you present it and how you interpret it. 
And uh, if we look at the Oxford Dictionary um, um, uh, definition of statistics, it says that statistics is the practice or science of collecting and analyzing numerical data in large quantities, especially for the purpose of inferring proportions in a whole from those in the representative sample. And that last part of the, that definition here is very important, is that you're going to infer things from uh, uh, samples. And we will get back to that in a minute. But probably the most important uh, take home message today is that without statistics, without proper use of statistics, you cannot write good scientific papers or make reliable clinical reports. But you have to be very careful because you can lie with statistics. I'm not saying you are going to lie intentionally. And, uh, but by not using the right uh, statistical approach, uh, the right statistical method, which will depend on the type of data you have and the type of investigation you have undertaken, you may uh, completely bias your results. And that's not what we want. We need to be impartial in science. Um, <clears throat> so there are different sources of data, which are really the raw materials you're going to use for your statistical tests. Um, so what could these be? Well, they could be just routinely kept records like hospital medical records, and I'm sure that some of you do that. Surveys, experiments in the lab, you know, where you measure concentration of something, of uh, diffusion of something, whatever. Clinical trials, uh, you can work with big databases or with published reports. So there are many different sources of data. And so any characteristic uh, that, can, that can be measured or classified from the data into categories is called a variable. So there are many possible variables that you can look at in the data and, and it all depends on what you're interested in. Um, <clears throat> so what are the types of variables we can have? There are qualitative and quantitative variables. So qualitative variables, are uh, that they cannot be measured with numbers. So they are just categories, like for instance, the gender, male or female, and, uh, but the categories cannot overlap. Uh, each category must represent a different part of, of, your, of your entire population. And they must cover, all the categories must cover all together all the possibilities. Um, so in qual qualitative variables, you can have nominal variables. So these are, it's not that one is uh, has a lower ranking than the other. There is no inherent ranking. They are just all, you know, like male or female, and, you know, males and females are equally important. It can be yes or no. It can be uh, different blood groups. So there is no ranking. And then there are ordinal variables where categories can be ranked from low to high, from weak to strong, things like that. For instance, response to a treatment. Uh, it's unimproved, improved, or much improved, or uh, pain severity, you assess uh, the pain. So no pain, slight pain, moderate pain, severe pain. So these are ordinal variables. They can be ranked. And then we have uh, the quantitative variables, which are those that probably most of you deal with. So these can be measured with numbers. For instance, the weight, the height, concentration of something. And this can be either continuous or discrete. So continuous uh, quantitative variables, they can take any value uh, within some uh, uh, range or interval. For instance, weight of something or height, blood pressure, cholesterol level, if let's say you, you do neuroanatomy, you want to measure the dendritic length, total dendritic length of a certain type of neurons, or fluorescence intensity, if you do immunocytochemistry, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and then 
we have discrete uh, variables, which are usually a count of something. So generally, they are just integer value. You count, for instance, you count how many male giraffes are in Dinder National Park in Sudan. Okay, so these are discrete variables. So if we just summarize the different types of variables, we have uh, qualitative or categorical uh, variables, and then quantitative variables. So in the, I'm oh, sorry, I'm just going to uh, use uh, a pointer, laser pointer. I okay, here we are. Can you see the laser pointer? Uh, so, uh, so nominal uh, variables uh, are not ranked, they are just names. And the ordinal variables are ranked uh, from low to high, from high to low, um, strong to weak, weak to strong, etc. And then the quantitative variables can be either discrete, like you count observations of something, or continuous, where you just measure values. Uh, and the, the variable types and the measurement types you're going to use uh, have very strong implications on how the data should be displayed or summarized. And it will determine the kind of statistical procedure that you're going to use. So you really need to understand uh, your data. Now, uh, what is a population? So population is a, a whole group of some entities, some individuals that you would like to know something about. It can be anything. And then, uh, so, and then what you want to know is parameters from this population. A parameter being a characteristic of the population in which we have a particular interest, for instance proportion of population that would respond to a certain drug or the correlation between a risk factor and a disease in a population. Um, but populations are very big. You know, it could be like, for instance, you do something at the, the whole uh, Sudanese uh, scale and your whole population is all Sudanese uh, citizens. So it would be impractical to study that entire population, it would be too time consuming because uh, we are talking about millions of people and it would be very expensive and you would need a lot of people to undertake these studies. So instead of uh, studying the entire population, we can study what is called samples. Samples are subsets or entities that are randomly drawn from the population. And uh, so it should be done randomly. You cannot be biased toward a certain part of the population. And if the sample is representative of the population, then it, it will teach us something really useful about the population. So here you can see a whole population. And here within the circle, you see a sample of that population. But that circle could be here or here. And here on the right, you can see uh, three different samples drawn from this population. So what statistics uh, do is to address, address research questions using samples, so subsets of the population rather than the population itself. So um, if the population is characterized by parameters, uh, well, uh, and then if we take a, a random sample out of that population, then the, the sample will be characterized by statistics. So statistics are to sample what parameters are to the population. For example, the mean of the population, mu, uh, that's for the whole uh, population. And then uh, for the sample, it will be uh, y here. And Hopefully, if your sample is, is a good uh, representative of the population, these means are going to be quite close to each other. Now, of course, uh, uh, the, the size of the whole population, n, will be bigger than the size of the sample. Um, so what you're going to do, and that's extremely important, is that uh, once you have characterized your samples, you will 
be able uh, using statistical tools called statistical inference you will be able to to draw conclusions about uh, the population itself so a sample statistics is an estimator of a population parameter if it's done properly uh, so so from the samples you can go back to the population uh, so this this is called inductive statistical methods. So it will allow you to make predictions based on data taken from samples. Okay, and that so that's what statistics do. So to do uh, undertake statistical analysis, it has to be done in uh, several steps. Uh, two main steps. First, you need to describe uh, your sample. Uh, and we will get back to that in a minute. And it's a very important step. And then we're going to make the inference where we're going to use some tests that will help us deduce the properties about the population as a whole using what we have observed in the sample. And this is done in two ways, either by testing a hypothesis or by uh, making an estimation. Okay, let's... Uh, spend some time now talking about the, the methods for descriptive uh, statistics. So this is everything uh, that deals with data collection and organization, summarizing data and describing its characteristics, plot the data, which is very important. You want to visualize the data. So this is the stage where you are going to have to do some exploration. Uh, you need to play around and get a good feel of the data because basically all you have first, you, you will open a huge spreadsheet and you are going to see thousands of numbers. And, you know, just by looking at these numbers, you, you cannot possibly have a clue about what you have in there. So you need to play around and do some preliminary analysis. Often, uh, I would say almost always graphical. Uh, and, and that will help you reveal already some trends about your data. And it will help you look at patterns and possible relationships between groups. And that will already tell you whether the assumptions you had have actually been as satisfied or not. And then also by looking how the data is distributed, you will know which model you should use and procedure you should use to make your statistical inference. So what about plotting your data? So plotting meaning visualizing your data with graphs. And graphs are very important. I mean, nobody wants to look at endless tables of numbers. They are boring and they are really difficult to look at. I mean, I'm not saying they're not important. You need to have them. And if somebody wants to go and look really in detail at what you have done, uh, they need to have the numbers. But the, the graphs let really the data speak for itself. Um, uh, and we'll, they will help you get a really good feel about the data before you, uh, you do further analysis. Uh, because the, these graphs and these plots are much easier to understand and to interpret than looking at columns of numbers. And they will help you reveal patterns in the data, which may already shed light on the appropriate model and, anal and analysis you should use. Uh, okay, so here are some examples. So these are graphs for categorical data. Uh, and the most common is just the bar charts. And I'm sure all of you have used bar charts. So here you look at percent of uh, uh, world spending, uh, pharmaceutical spending, this is from a long time ago, 97, for uh, different uh, countries or continents. And as you see, the highest uh, spending was United States. Unfortunately, it was very low for Africa. Uh, but that already gives you a good uh, a, a good idea about how uh, pharmaceutical spending is uh, spread uh, around the world. Now you can do the instead of using a bar chart, you can use a pie chart, uh, where you know you put everything in a circle, and well proportionally again here you see the USA has the largest, 
and uh, Africa, where is Africa? A tiny, tiny white one here, almost nothing. Um, and I per I'm personally not a great fan of pie charts, but that's very personal. And then you can have a segmented bar chart where you stack everything on top of each other. I'm not a great fan of that either. In my opinion, the, the bar charts are the best, but that's really uh, just me. Um, okay, here's another bar chart uh, for number of health professional. Uh, we look at uh, number of workers, and that's that's in United States. Uh, dentists, medical doctors, nurses, and pharmacists. Do that. Many more nurses than anything else. Um, now we can do uh, more interesting things with that. We can see how these different professions are distributed in the private sector in red, as opposed to the public sector in green. And um, so we can, that already reveals something. So here we cluster the bar charts for every profession. Uh, each cluster contains a private and public uh, data. And you can see that uh, there are many more nurses in the public um, uh, sector than anywhere else. So more spending on nurses. Um, and uh, so you can do that as a, a stack bar chart uh, or a segmented bar chart where he look, uh, he look at the percentage rather than the raw number of workers in each uh, uh, profession. Uh, you take the uh, each number for each one at 100%. And from that 100%, you see what percentage uh, is private and what percentage is public. Uh, so these are all very useful. And then, uh, and but then you can plot by sector, public versus private, as opposed to by profession. And so that will allow you to look at the data from a different angle, and it will highlight different aspects of the data. And here again, you can see here, I, I think it becomes very obvious that in the public sector, uh, there, is, there are many more nurses and, uh, and, and not enough spending on, on dentists and on doctors. Uh, and, um, and, you know, as if, because of course, nurses are, they have much lower salaries. So it's, it's cheaper to hire nurses, but nurses should not, they are very important, but they, they shouldn't replace uh, dentists and and uh, and I don't know neurologists or pediatrists or whatever. Uh, there should be a balance between that. So this is quite worrying. Um, and here are different ways to look at the same. Again, uh, we are not going to get into details, but this is really a, a matter of uh, personal. A preference the way you are going to want to uh, uh, to look at that. Uh, what about graphs for quantitative data? Well, um, we can use histograms, which are very useful, uh, frequency polygons, and then box plots. But I will get back to bo box plots a little bit later because we need to understand a few other things uh, before that. And box plot, many people don't know how to use box plots. And they, you should, if you don't, I hope that after this lecture, you will be convinced that they are really a good thing to use. Um, so, okay, so histograms, uh, a histogram will divide the data into a number of chosen uh, uh, intervals or bins, and each of these bins will have the same size, the same width. And then uh, what you're going to do, you're going to count the number of the observations that fall within each interval, and you're going to plot that. Um, and, then, uh, and then you can have a relative frequency histogram or polygons, where instead of counting the number of observations, you you plot the proportion. So your 100% uh, is the highest number of, of observations or the total observations. And then, uh, and then yeah, the total number of observations. 
and then you will see what percentage of observations fall within each class, each interval. <clears throat> and, um, and I think that probably, uh, so here you normalize uh, the view and it is sometimes very useful uh, because sometimes uh, just counting the, the raw numbers of observations can be a little bit misleading. Um, now, histograms are very good uh, at revealing uh, the shape of the distribution of your data. Like you see, so here you have, uh, uh, um, you see a, a histogram where most values are in the, at, at the lowest, uh, uh, the lowest values here. And then it has a long tail uh, to the right. So this is a skewed histogram. Uh, and uh, you can also see how, um, uh, how peaky they are or how many peaks you have. Uh, and we will get back to that. Now, so this is all very useful, but if you want to display several histograms, uh, it's very difficult to su superimpose them. It's possible, but it's very confusing to look at. And, uh, or you, you may have to draw them side by side and you can very quickly fill your page with histograms and it might become really difficult to look at that. So it's better to, uh, than to use something else like a, a plot like this, which is uh, that, that's called a relative frequency polygon, where you can superimpose uh, data from different groups. So here you measure uh, something uh, uh, in males in uh, blue and females in pink between the age of 25 and 65. And you can see the difference within the groups. Uh, it still shows you that, uh, you know, you have uh, a peak at the age of 35 and then it goes down, but you can really see the difference between the groups here. You couldn't do that with an histogram. Now, uh, the way the data will be distributed from the lowest to the highest value can vary a lot. And if you have a perfectly symmetrical distribution of all the values, like this one here. So this is a histogram uh, and it shows you the frequency. The, so you see that most of the values are right in the middle here. So that is that is a classical, uh, what is called a bell-shaped histogram. Um, it's called a Gaussian distribution. But distributions, most of the time are not like that. They're not perfect. This one, for instance, is very skewed. You see most values are at the lowest uh, uh, levels here, and then you have, and it's very skewed to the right. This one has two peaks. That is called the bimodal distribution. So you have two population of something here. Okay. Um, so, when you do descriptive uh, statistics, well, first of all, look at the, the frequency distribution of the data, and you, we have just done that looking at the plots. You are going to use measures of central tendency. In other words, you know, what is the highest value? You know, where, where is the center of all the values? Um, and how and then measures of dispersion, meaning how much the, the, the data varies from that central tendency. So uh, how much is it spread? How much is it scattered? And then you can use measures of position for a given uh, data point. You will know how far it is from the center uh, in, in your distribution. Um, and um, you can you will use uh, different measures of the shape of your distributions and we'll do that with graphs and uh, you are going to uh, be able to uh, look at what is called the skewness so you know if the distribution is skewed in one direction or another or the kurtosis kurtosis being the peakedness 
of a distribution. We, we will get back to that. Um, okay, so what are the measures, different measures of central tendency? Well, the, the one everybody knows is the mean or arithmetic mean. We see the average of all values in a sample. So here we have a group of five people and we count how many uh, friends each one of these uh, people have. So we find that one has one friend, one has two friends, two have three friends, and one has four friends. So the mean is where we add all these values and when divided them by five, which is the, the N of your sample, okay? And so you get a number here, which is 2.6 friends per person, which is obviously, uh, that is not, I mean, you cannot have a fraction of a human being. So this is just a model, okay? But it tells you what, it tells you what is the, the central tendency. Now, uh, the median is another uh, value of central tendency. So in order to uh, find the median, you need to rank all your values from lowest to highest. Uh, and then the median will be the value that will be right in the middle. And it is much less sensitive to extremes, to what we call outliers than the mean, and we will get back to that. And then uh, another uh, measure of central tendency is the modes, which simply tells you what is the most common value. Uh, now, the big problem with the mean is that it, is, it can be very strongly influenced by outliers. Outliers being observations that are, that are really far away from the central tendency. And, uh, you know, they can be due to some accidental sampling or whatever. And in some cases you should get rid of them. But that can really distort the mean as a measure of central tendency. And the median or the mode are much less affected by uh, outliers. So in many cases, it's better to use those. Okay, so now uh, let's talk more about the median and that will uh, lead us to see how we can build box plots uh, because uh, box plots use the median and what is called quartiles uh, to be built. So first you need to increase, uh, sort the data in increasing order from low to high values. And then uh, the median will be the middle value if n is odd. Uh, if let's say you have uh, uh, five uh, observations, so the median will be number three, the, the value you find at the third place. Uh, and if uh, n is even, if let's say you have uh, 10 values, then the median will be the average between value 5 and value 6, okay? So, um, so this will give you a measure of the center of the data. And then quartiles simply divide the set of all these ordered values into four equal parts. Uh, so the first 25 percent of all values uh, uh, will be, that's the, the first quartile. The second quartile is the second 25 percent. And the third quartile is the third 25 percent. And then you have the fourth quartile here. Uh, so the median is equal to the second quartile because it's right in the middle. It's at 50 percent of all the values. Okay. So Q2 is the second quartile and it is equal to the median. And uh, what we call the interquartal quartile range is the difference between Q3 and Q1. Okay, so the, the difference between these two that is called the interquartile range, which gives you really an indication of the spread uh, from the median. Okay. Um, now, to build box plots, we use the median and the inter interquartile range, and then that will really help us understand how values are spread in different data sets. So first of all, we need to find the median. 
So let's say we have 10 values, five here, five here. You can already see that they are not, uh, they are not spread equally. Okay, so there is quite a lot of variation in this sample here. So the median is uh, just be, just in the middle here. So we have five observations to the left and five to the right. So right in the in between five and six, that's where our median is, the quartile two. Now we need to find uh, Q1 and Q3, which will be at exactly at the third value and uh and at uh, the eighth value okay so and the interquartile range will be the difference between these two and then uh we will draw a box uh between q1 and q3 and uh, so that is your box of the box plot and then uh, we draw a line exactly at the position of the median at Q2 here, okay? That is your median. Now we need the whiskers. Uh, and there are different options, but the way you draw the whiskers is by, first you extend from both edges of the box. So from Q1 and Q3, you extend uh, a line that goes 1.5 times the interquartile range you go to the left and to the right here. And then you pull that line back until you meet an observation. So when you go to the left, so your whisker will end up at the first observation. However, on the right, because you have much more spread of, of data here, you see that the, the when you draw it back, where you're going to make your whisker here and you're, you're leaving this value out here. So this is, uh, it's further away than, uh, it's far away from the interquartile range. So this is an outlier. And then uh, you can make, uh, there are different ways you can present that box. Uh, so you can show all the values. And so you have the box here, you have the median, and that shows you basically the variation, the spread, and you see you have one outlier. Or you can also not show all the values and, and just show only the outlier, for instance. Uh, that's another possibility. That is really a question of uh, personal choice. And then to build a plot, well, you turn uh, the box, uh, you, you tilt it by 90 degrees, and now you can you can just have parallel boxes like that uh, for different uh, groups for which you make obse different observations. So here, for instance, you plot uh, how many hours uh, students sleep every day of the week, and uh, and as you can see, you see that uh, they tend to sleep much more during the weekend. Um, but they also there is more of a tendency towards low values that is probably because they go out and party on the weekend so uh, sometimes they won't sleep that much but in general they try to uh, have a lie in in the morning uh, so so this this really this is a very useful way to look at how uh, 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 these observations change throughout the week and here's a, a very uh, revealing uh, large box plot um, and, uh, and showing you the, the concentration of sulfur dioxide, which is very toxic in the air uh, that was in some uh, industrial city in the United States, can't remember which one, uh, measured every month of the year starting in November to October 1969, and then, uh, and then going all the way to 1972. Uh, so what do we see here? So each box represents the measurement of uh, uh, sulfur dioxide within uh, uh, one month. And what do we see? 
First of all, we see that from 1969, end of 1969 to the end of 1972, there is a, a general reduction in the concentration, which is good. Probably uh, people in that city have made efforts to uh, fight pollution. Uh, that's good. And you see that it is higher in winter months, maybe because it's related to heating and uh, some more toxic gases emanating from houses, uh, from buildings uh, in during months when you need uh, central heating. Uh, you see that it's skewed towards uh, higher values and that the spread increases with level, which is not really very surprising. Now, so this is a <coughs> very, very useful way of uh, looking at data and you, it would be really challenging. I mean, it would be impossible to do the same using parallel histogram. Just imagine you would need a histogram for each month of the year. It would be really, really difficult. Um, okay, so we have looked at uh, measures of central tendency. We have seen how to build box plots, which I really hope you're going to, you are using. Uh, and if you haven't used so far, you will be more convinced to use after this lecture. Now we're going to look at measures of dispersion. Um, and um, so meaning how, how scattered is the data uh, uh, on both sides of the central tendency? So we can look just at the range, which is simply the difference between the minimum and the maximum observed. Um, and we can look at the variance, which is a measure of the amount by which values differ from the mean of their distribution. So that's very, a very useful uh, parameter. Um, <clears throat> and um, useful statistics, sorry. Uh, and then the standard deviation, which is very much linked to the variance, which is the average amount by which values differ from the mean of their distribution. Um, so let's get back to the mean. So, uh, so the mean is a model uh, that can summarize the data. And as we have seen, we go back to our little uh, example from earlier uh, when we counted uh, how many friends each one of these five people have. And we found that the average, the mean was 2.6 friends, which is clearly a hypothetical value because you cannot have uh, a fraction of a friend. So how can we know whether this is an accurate model, that value here, 2.6? Well, the only way you can know is by uh, looking at the difference between all the, all the observations, like the one, two, three, three, and four, and the model, and that, and uh, the mean. So, uh, so we can, for instance, calculate the magnitude of the difference between uh, each data point and the mean. So, uh, so the one that had only one friend has, so the difference is negative minus 1.6 and et cetera. So you can, so if you, the total error will be the sum of all these differences here, but we will find that you get zero, uh, that no errors detected. And that is simply because all the positive and the negative values cancel each other. So that's not very useful. So uh, all you have to do, uh, I mean, looking at the difference is good, but instead of just looking at the difference, you just take the, the square value of each one of them. So you get rid of the negative values now. It's all positive. So, so instead of having the sum of errors, you have the sum of the squared errors, SS. So if we take, uh, if we just the sum of errors, we got zero. And the sum of squared errors, now for the same data set, we get a number which is 5.2 okay um, so this gives us some measure of the accuracy of the model but it's not very useful because 
Of course, it will depend on the amount of data. The, the more data, the larger, the, because you just add these numbers one to each other. So the larger your n, the bigger your uh, sum of squared errors. So that's actually totally useless. Uh, so the solution is to simply divide that number by the number of observation, and that is the variance, uh, which and I don't ask me why I, I do not really understand this, but uh, for uh, smallish samples, uh, it's better to use, instead of using the total number of the samples, we use n minus one. So you take the uh, sum of squared errors and you divide it uh, by n or by n minus one, and that gives you the variance, which is, S square. Um, and uh, so the variance is a single number that will really help you see how spread out your distribution is. So here, for instance, you have uh, um, uh, three distributions that all have the same mean, exactly the same mean, but they will have completely different variances. See here, all the values are the same. Here you have a, a, a normal distribution, and here you have a, a very high number just right in the middle here, and 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 then low all around. So, but they all have the same the same mean, um, but the variance is very different. Now, what is the relationship between the variance and the standard deviation? So the problem with the variance, it's it's a value that is measured in squared units, right? It was the, the uh, squared uh, uh, sum of standard uh, errors and then divided by n or n minus one, but it's still squared. So it's, it's not in the same unit as the original measure. So it's kind of difficult to compare. Um, and, um, so all you have to do is take the square root of the variance and that gives you, and that goes back to the same uh, uh, unit as the original measure. Uh, so it's easier to understand. And that is the standard deviation. So the standard deviation is uh, the variance, uh, the square root of the variance. So for our same uh, data set we have looked at before, the standard deviation is one point. 14. So it is a measure of how well the mean represents the data. Uh, okay, here are examples of uh, uh, two uh, data sets uh, that have the same mean, but uh, in one of them you see that the, uh, the data is close to the mean. So, uh, so the standard deviation will be small. So here it's 0 0.55. And then, so the mean is still 2.6. Huh? We have our friends here, how many friends each person has. And then, <clears throat> sorry, and here we have uh, a much bigger uh, vari uh, variability with the same mean. So here the standard deviation is much larger, it's 1.82. So what we can conclude from this is that uh, in this case here, I mean, when the data is close to the, to the mean, then uh, the standard deviation is a good fit of the data. But when the data is scattered so much, it's not such an accurate representation, the mean, because every single data point is really far away from it. Now, what is the difference uh, between the standard deviation and the standard error of the mean? Well, the standard error of the mean is the standard deviation divided by square root of the number of observations. Uh, and many people are confused about uh, the difference and they, they're not sure when they should use one or the other. And people quite often tend to use the standard error of the mean because it gives much smaller error bars, so it looks nicer, but it's not necessarily the right thing to do. Um, okay, so what is the difference? 
So the standard deviation, which I've just talked about, it will quantify how much the values vary from each other. It will give you a, a, an estimate of the scatter or the spread of your observations. And it will not necessarily change in a predictable way as you acquire more data. Um, except if, well, at, at least if your sample is representative of the data. Now, the standard error of the mean uh, tells you something else. It tells you how much variability there is uh, in these statistics across samples from the same population. And it will become smaller if your samples become larger. So the closer your sample is in size to the population, the smaller the standard error will get. Um, but this is not necessarily true for the standard deviation. So here, uh, just to illustrate the difference between the standard deviation and the standard error of the mean. So the standard deviation really quantifies the scatter of the data. So here it's very scattered. And, and the standard error of the mean quantifies how far the sample mean is from the true population mean, okay? So this is the mean in uh, one sample, that's in another one, another one, another one, another one. So the standard error, if you have large samples, your, your uh, mean will be very close to the population mean and the standard error will be small. So when should you use the standard deviation and when should you use the standard error of the mean? And I'm sure all of you have made that mistake. I have made it many times, believe me. But now I try to be more careful. So if the scatter is really caused by true biological vari variability, so you need to show that variation. There's nothing wrong with that. It doesn't mean that you don't know how to do experiments. But, you know, you may have something really interesting there, you know, like you study something with tremendous biological variability. So you really need to report the standard deviation and not the standard error here. Um, and the best would be to actually show a scatter plot of all the data points uh, and then and then you could maybe have a bar at the mean and then uh, and then whiskers showing the standard deviation. Or you could maybe report the largest and the smallest value. Uh, but there is no reason to report only the mean and the standard deviation. You can do whatever you like. Uh, now, on the other hand, if you are using a system with no biological variability, the scatter does does not result from biological variability, but it, it may result from experimental imprecision. Uh, because maybe you're, you're, you have been a bit sloppy in the way you have measured the concentration of something and you haven't done enough uh, repetitions. So here you need to report the standard error. Uh, the standard deviation is much less useful. And then in this case, the standard error of the mean will give the readers of your paper a sense of how well you have determined the mean. So small standard error means that you have done very good, very rigorous repetitions of your um, uh, observations. Okay, so uh, now um, let's talk a little bit about uh, um, how far you can be uh, in the distribution. So if you say you look at the variable, it, it will follow what is called a normal distribution if it is continuous and then if the, the, the histogram or the frequency graph follows this very characteristic, completely symmetrical bell-shaped form. So this is, it's called a, a Gaussian distribution. And in this case, when, when the, the distribution is normal, the mean, the median, and the mode all have the same value and is right here in the middle, okay? So now you can, uh, for individual observations, and then, okay, and this is one standard deviation here away from uh, the mean, two standard deviation, three and four, okay? Now, uh, 
if you want to know how far a certain observation is uh, from uh, the mean, you will use you can use what is called the standard score or z score, which is a signed value, uh, which is the number of standard deviation observation is away from the mean. Uh, so uh, positive z scores mean that the value is above the mean. Um, if let's say you have a value with a z-score of plus four, it means that th this is a value that is quite unusual. It's really far away from the mean. So, um, and uh, uh, negative uh, z-scores just goes the other way around. <clears throat> now, uh, in bell-shaped distributions of data, so those that have normal distribution, about 68% of all the values will fall within plus or minus one standard deviation uh, from the mean, okay? So this is your mean here, peak observation, and uh, this is minus one standard deviation and plus one standard deviation, okay? So majority of the data. And 95% of the values will fall within two standard deviation. This is it here. And this 95% is some uh, some kind of magic number where that's called that's what we call the normal reference range. It's a range of values for which you can be 95% confident that that range contains a true mean, uh, or in other words, the probability that the mean is not within that range is less than than five percent so that you your p smaller than 0 0.05 which i'm sure all of you have used and then uh 99.7 percent of the values are within three standard deviations of the mean okay so these are confidence intervals okay um that's what that's what i call confidence intervals um okay sorry yeah um so when you analyze uh your data uh quantitative data first you need to check whether the distribution of your observations is normal and i mean the way you will do that you you will uh, use uh, statistical packages spss or whatever i don't know what you use um and uh, you will just enter all your values and it will check it for you it will tell you if it's normal distribution or not not that you have to calculate that yourself uh now and whether it is normal or not will help you choose the correct statistical test to uh for your statistical and inference to ask your question so so there are two types of tests the parametric tests and non-parametric tests so uh in order to do parametric tests you have to to meet four assumptions about the data whereas the non-parametric tests are much much looser uh, you have to make a very very few or no assumptions at all so uh in order to undertake a parametric test the four assumptions that have to be met uh, 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 so if you want your test to be accurate is that first of all the data must have a normal distribution so you must have that nice bell-shaped Gaussian uh, uh, curve that we have seen the variance must be homogeneous uh, throughout the data it should not it's not that you should have like part of the range with a lot of variance and another one uh, with very little variance. It should be the same everywhere. Uh, the distance between points of the scale should be the same along the entire scale. So it should really be regular intervals. And then uh, data from different subjects must be independent from each other. In other words, the values that correspond to one subject cannot influence the values corresponding to another subject completely independent. So if these four uh, assumptions are met, then you can do a parametric test. Um, and uh, just uh, here once more, I would like to show you, talk a little bit about uh, 
histograms, I mean, the, the distributions, looking at distribution that will really help you uh, uh, knowing whether your data is uh, normally distributed or not. Um, and uh, and you should only if your data looks like that you should do a parametric test okay otherwise you have to use non-parametric tests so uh so here it is skewed here it's bimodal here it's completely flat etc and then uh so frequent departure from normality are well skewness uh, so which is a lack of distribution symmetry so here you have a positive skew or negative skew and that's no skew that's a normal distribution and then the kurtosis is the measure of the degree of peakedness in the distribution uh, so you could have the same variance and the same skew but a different peakedness okay like look here for instance at these two here this one is much more peaky than this one um <clears throat> Now, uh, for the second phase, the inferential phase, you are going to test a hypothesis. Uh, for instance, you want, your question is whether the dif difference between your groups regarding a certain variable, for instance, you want to know whether mice in group A are heavier than mice in group B. Uh, and so when you have two groups, uh, in order to test whether there are significant differences between the groups, if the distributions are parametric, you can use what is called a t-test. If it's non-parametric, you will use the Mann-Whitney or Wilcoxon rank sum test. And if you have more than two groups, uh, but the distributions are parametric, you will use the uh, analysis of variance or one-way ANOVA or non-parametric. If it's non-parametric, we'll use the kruskal wallis test. And for instance, if you uh, want to measure relationship between two continuous variables, for instance, relationship between daily intake in calories and increase in body weight, then you can do a correlation test which works both for parametric and non-parametric data. It's just that you have, a, you have to have a continuum in your data. Okay, so let's look at a comparison between two groups. So uh, your distributions are uh, um, normal, as you can see here. So this is uh, your control here in blue, and that's after treatment. You see the values are lower here but both are, uh, have a normal distribution. Um, so you want to know whether these differences are significant. That's what your t-test is going to do. Um, so what it does is it's going to look at the difference between the means relative to the spread or the variability of, uh, uh, of these uh, that you find in distributions. Um, because if there is a lot of spread in both of them, it means there is a lot of noise and the difference may not be significant. Okay, what do I mean? Uh, here, so this is a difference uh, when you have medium variability between your two distributions. Here you have very high variability, you see. You have the same difference between the means as here, but you see there is so much overlap between these distributions. So your t-test will not be significant here. And here you have very low variability. Here you have very sharp distribution. So here it's, you probably don't even need to do a test. I mean, you can see it by eye probably. Um, so basically what the t-test is, is, it gives you a value which is called the t-value which is uh, give you it's a, it, it 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 tells you how much signal there is signal being the difference between the means of the two groups and uh, divided by the noise so it's the signal to noise ratio and the noise is the variability between the groups okay uh, and then so that number is a t value and uh, so when the, uh, that 
that value is higher, it means that your um, your test will be significant, and you will uh, it will give you the probability, the the confidence interval that you know that you know that that uh, your test is is uh, is accurate. Um, so there are three types of t test independent t-test, which compares means of two completely independent groups of values, or paired t-test, which looks at the difference between two variables for a single group. Um, and uh, so the second group is the same as the first one, but after some treatment has been applied. Let's say you look at the uh, firing rate of uh, a certain type of neurons, let's say pyramidal neurons, the, the hippocampus, you recall from a slice, right? In a chamber, you have electrode in, uh, in uh, uh, pyramidal cells and you measure the firing rate and then you apply a drug that is changing something to the synaptic network connectivity and, uh, and eventually uh, the firing weight will increase or decrease. So this will be, because you record from the same cell each time, uh, between control and then your uh, treatment. So this is a paired t-test. Or, uh, and then the third type is the one sample t-test, where uh, the mean of a single, uh, you will test whether the mean of a, a only one variable differs from a specific, a specified constant, okay? So you just need one group. Uh, let's say you want to know whether all the values are different from 10, some, something like that. Uh, now, if you have more than uh, two means, you cannot perform several t-tests on the same data. If let's say you have uh, three or four groups, so you you know you might be tempted to do a t-test between the first and the second, and then the second and the third, the third and the fourth, or maybe the first and the third. You cannot do that. And why is that? Uh, that is because it will increase what is called a family-wise error rate. So the what is the family-wise error rate? It's it's a probability of making one of more false discoveries, which is called a type one error, when you perform multiple hypothesis tests on the same data. Um, so let's say you compare three groups and you carry out three t-tests. Now for each one of them, you will get a probability uh, that it is significant, right? So, uh, so normally uh, p smaller than 0 0.05, that will be your threshold for statistical significance. So it means that for each t-test, the probability of not making that error is 95%. So it's one minus 0 0.05, okay? So that's p smaller than 0 0.05. That's for a single t-test. That's good. Now, if you use three groups, uh, each time you do a test like that, um, uh, you have to add another, um, you, you add 5% error each time. Uh, so you have to, uh, so you, so you have to multiply uh, the probability, uh, all the probabilities by three here. So it's 0 0.95 times uh, time 0 0.95 point 0 0.095, which gives you 0 0.587, which means that the probability of making at least one type, one error has now increased to 14.3%, which is uh, 1 minus 0 0.857, okay? So it's a big difference. And if you do it uh, between, um, um, if let's say you compare five groups instead of three, the family-wise error will be 40%. It's huge, so you cannot do that. So basically, in order to see how much, uh, what is the probability that, that you're making a false observation, 
is uh, you is uh, one minus zero point ninety five exponent the number of times you do the test. Okay, so this is really scary. So don't do that. Uh, so if you have uh, multiple comparisons, you don't do the t test. T test only for two groups. You will use the analysis of variance or ANOVA, and uh, the statistic for ANOVA is what is called the F ratio. The F ratio is uh, the variance between the groups divided by the variance within each group, so individual variability, okay? Because each group is still composed of many observations and you do have uh, intrinsic variability in each group. So if uh, F is uh, greater than one, it means that the variance amongst the groups is greater than within each group. So that means that uh, the difference between the groups is uh, significant. So in an ANOVA, you always test whether F is significantly higher than one. Uh, but, okay, you can have, like, you may have, I don't know, 10 groups or whatever, and then so, and you will get, uh, uh number uh, greater than one and but that won't tell you it means that there is a difference between your means but it won't tell you between which, which groups because it it's not necessarily going to be between all groups and uh, generally you need to find out where you know which groups are the, the ones that really influence the the result so in order to do that you will apply what is called post hoc tests, uh, for instance, Turkey or Bonferroni. And again, this will all be in your statistical package. And uh, so, and that will give you a list of the difference between uh, uh, pairs of uh, observations. And uh, it will tell you where the significant difference is. And, but this post hoc test should be used only uh, if the ANOVA finds a significant F, uh, difference. Otherwise, you don't do them, of course. Um, now, you will do a one-way ANOVA if you measure a variable in uh, at least, well, more than two groups, so three or more groups, uh, and the means and the medians are distinct. So you want to know whether that's due to chance, or does it tell you that our groups are really different? Uh, which groups are different from which other groups that you will find out with the post hoc tests? And then uh, the two way ANOVA, or also known as two factor ANOVA, uh, will tell you how much a response is affected by two factors. For example, you want to measure a response to three different drugs in both men and women. So the drug treatment is one factor and there are three possibilities and the gender is another. So you want to know whether the response is affected by the drug, by gender, and how the two are intertwined. So in order to do that, you will use a two-way ANOVA. Um, okay, and I would just like to finish uh, with uh, a few words about correlation. Uh, so the correlation coefficient is an index number that will measure the magnitude and the direction of the relation between two variables. And so it ranges between minus one and plus one. Minus one means that there is a negative relation, meaning that when one is high, the other one is low or vice versa. And positive relation is just the opposite. I mean that when one is high, the other one is high too or when one is low, the other one is low too. And then zero means that there is no relationship whatsoever between these two uh, variables. Um, and uh, so in order to find that out, you will calculate what is called the Pearson coefficient R, and I'm sure that many of you have already used it. Uh, and, uh, and here you can see uh, correlation plots uh, um, one, so in this one here, so you, you have uh, one variable on X, the other one on Y, and here you see that there is no correlation at all. I mean, it's just a cloud of values 
and indeed the correlation coefficient is low. It's point uh, is zero. It's minus zero point zero four. Uh, here you have uh, some, um, you know, some negative correlation. You see that when x tends to be smaller, height uh, y tends to be larger. So here the uh, r is minus zero point thirty seven, and here you have a very strong positive correlation, meaning that when x is bigger, y is bigger, and here you see that the values are all along that line here. So here we have a high correlation of 0 0.86. So for the correlation, I mean, this can be used on parametric or non-parametric uh, data. Um, uh, so the, the two variables do not have to be measured in the same unit, but they have to be proportional. So they have to be linearly related, okay? Like if one, increases you know that something is always going to happen to the other one so you can always plot though okay uh so this is it really uh this is just a little summary of uh, uh different tests you can use um uh when you have uh, two or more than examples and um, you know and of course you know there are many things i have not talked about and and you know, and there are many things I don't know myself. You know, I'm not a statistician; I'm just a humble biologist. Um, and uh, but uh, I think this is really all I wanted to tell you. Um, so uh, okay, so now uh, yeah, okay. So what yeah. do I do now? Okay, thank you so much for uh, this wonderful talk. We are really yeah. Grateful to you, you very much for Thank participating you. and joining us in this webinar. As I mentioned, I'm with Maha Dahawi and Valeria. Sorry? Uh, so, as I mentioned, I was, I'm with Maha and Valeria. So, I don't know if they have comment or questions. Okay. Uh, first of all, we want really to thank you for this very impressive presentation. And uh, we 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 thought when we were when you were speaking about the gaps we had in the statistics, because <laughs> the questions are always there. Like, did we took the right uh, statistical tool or not? Uh, are we doing a continuous quantitative uh, studies or not? Yeah. So uh, we will start by uh, simple questions, like one for me and one for uh, Valeria, and then we will see uh, for the audience. Uh, for me, you mentioned about uh, the variation in the biological uh, studies, like when you know that there is a, a variation in the sample okay. that you are testing. Uh, can I go directly to use the standard error of mean? Or do you think I should pass through the standard deviation first? Like you, you stressed on this point, but I really want to make sure. Uh, it really depends on what you're looking at, uh, okay. you know, and and i think um, oh, if if you if you uh, if you look at values in you know quite a large sample but you know uh, you know like for instance i we do recordings in my lab from the retina the mouse retina we we see how they respond to light you know how the receptive fields are and there are so many different types of cells you know we recall from what's called the ganglion cells, and uh, there are many subclasses. And we recall with an array of 4,096 electrodes, which is mm -hmm. fantastic because we can put virtually the whole mass retina on the array. And so we recall from a huge population. Uh, but, you know, and so, uh, but we may still have, uh, if we look, let's say, at, uh, you know, I don't know. Uh, the duration of the response to the onset of the light we will get if we take the whole population of the cells together uh, we will get a big standard deviation because some of these cells have very transient responses to, but that and that's biological variability so you want to show that okay standard error is good when you do you know repetitive measures you know like you take many samples of the same and you know, and and uh, or you uh, uh, well, and you try to have really big samples, 
and uh, you know and it will really tell something about how well you have you have done your experiment okay mm -hmm. so it really depends on on you know i don't have a, a very straightforward answer to that okay you know, i totally way. understand yeah thank you thank you very much i i move to valeria for her question um, so first of all thank you for these very useful i cannot hear you well. yeah Sorry. thank you thank you very much for this uh, useful presentation is well it was very helpful for me because uh, there are, then i realized that they, there were a lot of things that i didn't understand uh, during my studies yes and um and uh, first of all um do you have any uh, recommendation book to read or something about statistics or what uh, did you you know what i i use i i don't um do you speak french oui <laughs> okay well <laughs> then i will uh, no it's very funny because um one of my students, uh, I have a French PhD student here, a lovely guy called Jean de Montigny. And just the other day, uh, he, wait, I just, I just need to, oh, no, I need to, uh, um, uh, uh, it's called uh, Statistic pour Statophobe. Uh, statistic for statophobe. Let's see. Uh, statistic for statophobe. Okay. Um, uh, here we are. I can, um, um, if I, I mean, I can share, maybe, let me just share the, if I share my, no, can, oh no. Okay. Yeah. Can I, can I, uh, no, but what I could do is send a link. Yeah for the pdf it's free huh but yeah you can send me the link and then i can share the link with, uh, uh, with all the audience in the uh, and in i the, shall i send it to you by email or? yeah send it to me by email and i also now can send it to all the audience yeah. on the comment yeah, unfortunately section it's in french um yeah. <laughs> so only people who speak french can read it and but it's fantastic i had but a look at it the other day and it's absolutely great Okay, I'm sending this to Mossab. Now, other than that, um, I'm not really uh, reading uh, statistic books. I mean, I, I use uh, statistics with, uh, well, I talk to people also, and I talk to people who know statistics better than me. You know, I have lots of my collaborators are physicists that these people no statistics like nobody else. I mean, they're really scary. <laughs> but I don't think you need to know that level of statistics to do yes. simple things. But um, I use, um, uh, do you know Prism from GraphPad? Yes. OK, yes, so that's what I use. And I think it has a very, very nice statistical package with lots of explanation. And you can actually go online uh, and you, you can find they really they, they have like a ebook or something like that where you can find lots of things about statistics and uh, so uh but you know i i mean to read a, a statistic that's really dry i wouldn't <laughs> recommend doing that and uh, i think you know it's just a matter you have to use it you have to understand the basic principles that's really important and then talk to people don't be scared you know and Talk to your supervisor, and uh, and uh, and you know if you're in a doubt, just ask other people, or you can go. I mean, now on the internet you can find everything. You know, if let's say you don't know the different, you don't understand the difference between the standard deviation and the standard error. You know, you can go and Google that, and you will find endless information on it uh some of it will be very complex and some will not um but um i i have never read a, a statistics textbook myself and i never will that i can actually <laughs> i have better things to do with my life <laughs> yes we already have a lot of experiments to perform so but that uh that document that mossab uh, will that's a pdf so okay it's 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 but it's only in french but it's okay. great thank you very nice 
I already shared it with the audience okay. right now in the Very comment good. section. Yes. Yeah, I, you know, maybe there is something similar in English. I'll, yeah. I'll try to find and then I, I, you know, I can send it later. Um, yeah, that same guy who, uh, who wrote that uh, French thing on s statistics for Statophobes also wrote uh, a wonderful little ebook like that on how to use, uh, you know, the language R. Do you know about R? Mm. Which is very uh, yes. for statistics. So, you know, it's called, uh, I use R without knowing how to program. And you can, it's actually you really not difficult. So, yes, yeah, so it's the same, uh, what's his name? Um, uh, Denis Poinceau. And uh, yeah, I mean, you know, you, you can find him. And uh, so I think it's, it's really great. So um, don't be intimidated. <laughs> Yes, because sometimes we uh, we uh, don't want to uh, show that we don't know. They they talk about uh, different statistics, uh, post hocs and everything, and sometimes we don't understand uh, very well. So, I mean, these are very basic things, but you know, it, it's I think you can do a lot just by knowing these few uh, basic things. You can already go quite far. And 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 uh, so the, uh, just out of curiosity, have you ever used box plots? No, <laughs> never. I have never okay. used. Uh, I I didn't. I knew few about it, and uh, so please try to use them from now on, because I think they are. It took me a long time to uh, to start using them. I said, "Oh, what is box plot? It looks too and, complicated." And is it is it good to, uh, for example, box plots? For um, um, measurements, like uh, when you have different types of cells, for example, and you different want to measure, what, sorry, um, is it good to use box plots? For uh, I'm going to give you an example. I have uh, different uh, groups of cells of cells uh, for different conditions, and I want to measure the intensity of uh, the fluorescence, for example. Yes. And uh, and then I, to show that I have difference of intensity between the groups. Of course. OK. Of course. Absolutely. Absolutely. So I will try to use box plots with that. <laughs> Absolutely. And I mean, again, you can, uh, you know, all you have to do. So you use prism, you said. So yes, but, uh, the, I'm... choose box plots, you know, in the you have the options of the plots you want to, okay. and then, uh, you know, and then it will always show the median and you will have different options whether, you know, which uh, interquartal range you show and the length of the whiskers and, uh, you know, whether you show all the data points or not, there are many different options, but, you know, the basic principle is the same. And uh, I think it's very useful. Okay. <laughs> because you can see really the sp for every every point you know you will you see the whole spread the whole range and that's really very important and you can see how things change you know with time with whatever okay so okay good thank you very much for your advice <laughs> I think our voice is not very clear, so we go back to you if uh, there yeah. are questions. Okay. Okay. Actually, there is, uh, or there are many questions actually. Oh dear. From the audience. Okay. <laughs> My colleague uh, in us is asking which type of samples is best to use for a research. So is that not again? Which okay. type? Which type of samples are best to use for a research and does that varies according to the type of research she is asking as she mentioned because some says some says random samples are, are are ideal so does that go for all research types yeah but i i mean a sample should always be random uh you know from the population i mean if you don't take a random sample then uh you know it means that it's going to be biased, so it will not represent the whole population. So, so I'm not sure I really understand the question. 
Yeah, samples she, she, have to be random. Yeah, and uh, and so that you know, if you have, and of course, the bigger the sample, if you can afford taking big samples, then uh, and they are well randomized, then you are most likely going to uh, know something very useful and very truthful about the whole population. But okay. you know, you cannot if. If let's say uh, you want to know something about the entire population of Sudan, you know, uh, you're not going to go, so you should, uh, you know, you should take people of different ages and, you know, from who live in different area. But if let's say you want to know something about the, the entire population of Sudan and then you take only uh, individuals between uh, five and ten years old in in Khartoum, only in, then it will not it will not be a good uh, representative sample of of the the whole population of Sudan, right? Okay. She has also some sort of uh, follow up question. She mentioned also if she, she used certain sample type, let's say convenient samples. Could it reduce the power of her research? And if yes, how can she correct that? What, a conven what is a convenient sample? I don't know. I don't know <laughs> what she meant by convenient sample, but maybe others way of sampling, non, uh, uh, not, I mean, uh, uh, not random sample. Well, is it possible I, to... I, this is all about experimental design you know, rather than uh, statistics. And, uh, you know, it's not about it. This is a this is before you do the experiment. You know, it's experimental design. You have to decide how you're going to sample your data. OK, uh, so this is something very different and it really depends on the context. Uh, so it's impossible for me to 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 tell you, but this is not statistics. This is experimental design. It's, it's the phase that comes long before the statistics. Okay. And it really depends on, you know, the type of study. So okay. and I'm sorry, I, I cannot really answer that question. Okay. So uh, I just have also some sort of follow-up question to Valeria, Valeria question. As she mentioned, most scientists or researchers in the medical field or in biology in general are afraid or scared of statistics. So do you have any recommendation of, or suggestions to them to, to overcome this issue or this problem or this fear? Uh, I would say uh, don't be afraid to ask people uh, who know about it. Um, try to read about it but you know don't read uh, and you know if if you have access to something like prism you know from graphpad uh, and i think you can actually um uh, a lot of the let's see I, i'm oh i'm just going to go i, I just want to google here um uh, 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 graphpad graphpad uh statistics okay here yes there is a i can see that there is a a, a graph pad statistics guide it's a pdf mm -hmm. um okay I'm, I'm just opening that and uh, oh my goodness this has 402 pages <laughs> uh so i okay i'm going to send you the link also and that's free also. Okay. And that is going to be really good. Um, and okay, I'm just sending that to you, Mossab, again. Um, and I I have read, um, just, just, I have quite often gone to that, you know, when I don't know something. But, you know, if, if I have really no idea how to do something, I'm just asking somebody who knows better than me. I'm not afraid to ask, you know, it's, uh, you know, we, we don't, you know, there are many things I don't know. And I'm, I'm you know, I'm, I'm not ashamed of it. Um, 
And uh, okay, so this here I see is, uh, wow, it has everything. And actually some of the things I've shown you in my, in my talk uh, were taken, I think, from this guide. This is great. I'm going to, uh, I think it's even better than before. I'm going to download it for myself also. <laughs> <laughs> it's, uh, it has everything, well, a lot more than what I've talked about, of course. Uh, this is great, yeah. So I would say, just look at that. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I just want to say that uh, we really enjoyed this, this talk. Oh, we enjoyed the scientific context and we enjoyed the counseling part and how you are reassuring for the students and the scientists and i can see feedback here saying that they are really impressed by the by what you have just presented oh, and i'm wow. sure that um, we didn't say enough to be grateful but it's just a trial to convey to you uh, how we feel in the end of this uh, session i'm very We're really happy. impressed thank you so much we got the energy we got the science and we got the energy yeah, we are more motivated about learning of uh, we are more motivated about statistics than before <laughs> because you we know, were... want to contact me. i mean i'm not a statistics guru huh? yes, but, no, but, but just, just uh, for the biological part maybe it's because my my own knowledge of statistics is quite basic it's easier for me to explain it in simple terms. Yes. You know, I have some brilliant uh, colleagues, like I have one of my, uh, you know, really long-standing collaborators. He's a physicist in Edinburgh. And, uh, but, you know, when you start talking about this, he's, he's brilliant, <laughs> I love him. But, you know, we start talking about this thing with him. It's just like, it's like, like he's talking Chinese to me. <laughs> and <laughs> I said, stop. Please talk in a language that normal <laughs> human beings can understand, you know. <laughs> so, but you don't need that. You don't need that. And, you know, I mean, for, for you know, basic, uh, I mean, unless you, you know, you do, uh, you do uh, extremely, you know, uh, complicated quantitative study, uh, uh, well then yeah and then you would need to know really high level statistics but you know when you do uh, most uh, well in biomedical research you know I, I mean most things you are going to to measure and and you know are, are just quite simple you know i mean no your experiments may not be simple but no, the but way I, you are uh, going to treat yes. it uh, to you know to display it and but so just remember make lots of plots nice plots of your mm -hmm. data Okay, no, you know, I I hate papers or slides, even worse, or posters where people present uh, tables with numbers. Don't uh, do that. Please don't do that ever. Okay, it's terrible. Mm -hmm. I mean, the, you keep it and it's very important. You have to have these tables. And somebody who really wants to delve into your study would need to have access to these tables definitely and you know or like i tell uh, you know my students uh, you know when they write the phd dissertation or master dissertation I tell them don't put table you can put them in an annex at the end but what i want to see, i want to see plots graphs you need to visualize things you really need to important. put uh, you need to put your data in light so everyone will see uh, more easy what yeah. you want to show yeah exactly exactly yeah okay okay so i just would like to remind our audience that this webinar will be available in our youtube channel okay. and on behalf of uh, srf and trend in africa i want to thank you all for joining us today thank and you i want to thank you in particular professor evelyn it and we are very grateful to you to that and uh, thank you so much all and uh, bye for now thank you very much bye bye bye, bye. good evening